ladies and gentlemen, Bishop Hezekiah Walker. Under the anointing of Jesus of Nazareth, would you give him a great big hallelujah praise right now? Come on, tell everybody on 120 Live on the Word Network, you're alive and full of the Holy Ghost and you're ready to receive a word that's going to transform you forever. He is no stranger to the Word Network and surely not to World Harvest Church. He is my friend, my brother, the incomparable Bishop George Bloomer. Tell him, come on, preacher. Somebody open up your mouth and give the Lord a shout in the building. Come on, let's give him a shout in the building. Grab your name by the hand and shake your neighbor. Say, neighbor, if you have any intentions of hindering me of receiving my blessing tonight, change your seat right now because I come to praise him. Where are the praises? Where are the praises? Where are the praises? Where are the praises? Woo. Put your hands together for Pastor Rod Parsley, the only, the one and only. To his lovely wife, to Mother Parsley, to the family, to my friend and brother, I grew up with him, Hezekiah Walker. I don't do a whole lot of talking outside of the word of the Lord, so you may have your seats. You'll find me reading from, let me see where I'm going to be reading from on tonight. You'll find me reading from Luke's gospel, chapter number 10. Verse number 30, Luke's Gospel, chapter number 10, verse number 30, a few verses thereof. I'm reading from the G. Bloomer's Deliverance Bible. The wording might be just a little bit different, but the thought would be the same. And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem into Jericho and fell amongst thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounding him, leaving him, and departing, leaving him half dead. Everyone say half dead. And by chance there came a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed over on the other side. A preacher that doesn't want to work. Likewise, a Levite, when he was come to the place, he came and looked on him and then passed over on the other side. A choir member, a praise team leader, a usher, a deacon, a trustee, a worker of the church, looking at situations and uh, don't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, watch this here, but verse number 33 says, but a certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was. And when he saw him, he had uh, compassion on him. Uh, uh, not the elder, not the bishop, not the apostle, not the teacher. A, a, a Samaritan that don't go to nobody's church had compassion. You know, touch two people and say, have some compassion, have some compassion. Say, have some compassion, have some compassion. And uh, verse number 34, and he went and uh, went uh, and he went to him and bound up his wounds and poured oil and wine uh, into uh, his wounds and placed him on a beast and took him to an inn and said to the caretaker, take care of him. And on the morrow when he was to depart, he took two pence and gave it to the host and said unto him, take care of him. That's the second time he said it. Take care of him. And whatsoever you spend more, when I come again, I will repay you. When I come again, I will repay you. I want to use for a thought on tonight 
Don't count me out. I'm coming back. <laughs> Say to two or three people, I'm coming back. I don't like the way you said it. I don't like the way you said it. I, I want you to say it with some authority. Say, 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 neighbor, say, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we pray that your word would go forth with power. We pray that the word that would go forth on tonight would be a word that you've selected for your people's hearing. My obedience in delivering this word should bring us a corporate testimony that it was good for us to be here. The way that you're going to move, the way that you're going to bless, the lives that you're going to touch and change, we give your name praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'm going to preach for about 15 minutes or so, and I want to uh, um, uh, give you some instructions. Uh, the first three or four minutes, I'm going to minister prophetically to you, to some folks who's been going through very, very difficult times, uh, uh, so that you understand that this is your season to make your return. Uh, at any time in the message uh, you get your prophetic download I just want you to stand and turn that's all you have to do stand and turn stand stand try it right now try it try it try it. just stand and turn just stand stand and stand stand and turn that, that, that's it that's it and, and those of you that can't get up and turn too quick do like this do like this do, do like this do like this do like this all right now I want you to look at your neighbor and with authority say neighbor, neighbor. don't count me out I'm coming back again now, now look behind you and say to somebody, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. Say it, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. Look, y'all sitting, you need to stand up and say it to somebody, I'm coming back, I'm coming back, I'm, I'm coming back. The devil is a liar, I'm coming back, I'm coming back, I'm, I'm coming. I wish I had a church in here tonight. I'm coming back, I'm coming back. I'm, everything the devil took from me, I'm about to get it all back. I'm coming back, I'm coming back, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. I'm coming. Somebody need to shout it. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. The text opens up like this on this wise. It says, and there was a certain man who came from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Notice the condescending of the text. Notice how the text starts off. He comes from Jerusalem, the highest part, to Jericho, the lowest part. A Jerusalem, a type of heaven. Jericho, a type of world. No one in their right mind would leave hell we leave heaven to go to hell. Uh, most people would definitely leave hell to go to heaven, but to be in that lofty place and to leave there and come down that spiral existence down into the world is a dangerous thing to do. The Bible says that he was in Jerusalem, the, 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 the city of lights from any part in the valley. You could look up and it was the place that was lit. But Jericho and the road that led to Jericho was where certain parts of the text in the Bible was written. Yea, though I walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, fear no evil. The cracks and the crevices, the places where the thieves used to hang, hang out at and hide out at, waiting in the cup for individuals to pass through. He came down from Jerusalem into Jericho, and the text says he fell amongst thieves. My name is George Gary John Derrick Bloomer. I was born in New York City, 453 Columbia Street, apartment A, B, and C. My mom and my dad had nine children together. My dad went out of the wedding barn and had 15 other children by six women in Red Hook projects. Uh-huh, Papa was definitely a rolling stone. I dropped out of school in the ninth grade, not able to read. I came out of a family that everybody in the family was just just, just tore up, messed up, just strung out on drugs. I found myself really, really messed up, and I've gone through many challenges in my life. And the challenges that I've gone through in my life, I call those challenges my combination. The number, the numbers of my life. And I believe that every one of you that are in this room, you have a combination to your life also. My combination, my number is, not, is 8, 9, 12, 32, 47, 53. If you rock those numbers, you want to unlock who George Bloomer is. You have your numbers also. I don't know what your numbers are. You know what your numbers are, but my numbers are 8, 9, 12, 32, 47, 53. Uh, my first number starts at 8. 
At eight years old, my mama promised me, Georgia Bloomer, she promised me that she was going to give me a birthday party. The birthday party, uh, 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 when I was coming up, if we were going to have a birthday party, you had to plan for it because we was raised on government cheese and government butter, welfare. And so my mother taught us this. She says, I'm going to do something for your birthday, but it might not be on your birthday. I, I learned that. Some for your birthday, but not necessarily on your birthday. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and this time, she decided that she was going to give me a birthday party, and, and it worked out. The birthday party uh, consists of some onion and garlic potato chips, some uh, wise onion and garlic potato chips, some cheese doodles, a Duncan Hine cake, a chocolate that kind of slid to the side because... <laughs> because you put the icing on it while it was still warm. The, the big punch bowl that they would bring out and put the Kool-Aid in it and cut the lemons up to float on the top of, of top of the bowl. And they would change the lights and take the lights out and put a yellow light, a red light, or a blue light to change the aviance. They made the children believe that this birthday party was going to be for them, but in the projects where I was coming up is that the birthday party would start about 2 o'clock and end by 4.30, 5 o'clock, because at 6 o'clock, the real party was going to start. That's when the fish was going to fry and, and, and all kinds of stuff was going to happen. And so I'm so excited and a few of my friends came over and it was in the days of, you know, Soul Train. And they were doing the funky chicken and the click clacks and the bumps and the electric slide, all that kind of stuff. And there was a young boy, uh, Kevin Holmes, who was the dancer of the projects. And he could, he could, I mean, he could really, really put it down. He, he knew how to dance. He knew what to do. He knew what to, he knew what to do. He knew what, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. what to do and he, and, and, and he knew how to do it and so long story short uh, he came to the party and you're not having a party unless you have Kevin at the party and Kevin came to the party and he stood over on the side next to the big bowl of onion and garlic potato chips now in the projects when we were coming up not many people were that wise uh, because you know when the potato chips runs out and, 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 and the cake is cut and, 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 and the punch bowl goes low the party is over and so I wanted my party to last that meant that the onion and garlic potato chips had to last and it wasn't a backup in the room someplace. You know, I mean, this, this, this is ghetto party, you know, so this, this, you got to make this thing work and you got to make it last. And he going to stand over there on the side next to the potato chip bowl and coordinate his potato chip eating to his dancing. <laughs> and so I got a little bit upset. And I went over to him and I confronted him on that, tried to get him over from the, from, from, from the bowl where the potato chips was going on at. And uh, he pushed me, I pushed him back. We got into a scuffle on my birthday. This really, really agitated my mother. And so she got me and my mother tore me up and sent me to my, my room while the dancing was still going on. And because it was one of those, uh, you know, one of those real whippings that you get. <laughs> You ever had those kind of... <laughs> and, and, uh, I fell asleep. And when I woke up <laughs> from the sleep, they had cut the cake, blew out the candles, and that thing devastated me. That's eight years old. The first number to my combination. I'm locked in at eight. At nine, my dad, Thaddeus Bloomer, says that I'm going to come, and George, I'm going to take you out uh, on Christmas Eve for Christmas shopping. I wake up Christmas Eve morning. I sit in front of the door at 6 o'clock in the morning. I got my ski coat on, my, 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 my mittens, and my, uh, my, my, you know, my, 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 my cap on, and I'm sitting there at 6 o'clock in the morning. About 9 o'clock, the family's waking up. You can smell some uh, bacon cooking. They're working on the grits, and, and they're they doing their thing. We, used to, we didn't have biscuits. We used to make Johnny cakes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, we'll talk about that next time I come. And so, <laughs> my sister wakes up. My sister Cynthia, Hez, you know Cynthia. My sister Cynthia, me and Hezekiah, we grew up together. Uh, I was in one project, he was in the other project. We was chasing folks from one project to the next project. Talk about that when we come back the next time. And there, she woke up and she said, George, what you doing sitting there? And I said, Daddy's coming to pick me up. She said, Daddy, and my mother said, uh-uh, uh-uh-uh, don't you dare. Don't you dare say anything to that boy. If he wants to believe that his dad is coming to pick him up, let him believe it. And I was too young to understand that my mother was saying, he ain't coming. Four o'clock came, he wasn't there. Six o'clock, the music started. You know, we well on our way for Christmas. 1201 Christmas night, Thaddeus Bloomer did not show up at all. I believe that that was the door that was cracked that caused the 12-year-old little boy in me to become trapped. That was nine, eight, nine.
At 12, I used to go to the store for a lady who lived on the third floor in 453 Columbia Street. I used to go to the store for her. She had a living lover. The lover uh, moved out, and I would do little errands for her and what have you. And I noticed after the living lover moved out, I would go to the store for her, and she would give me a dollar, 50 cents, sometimes 75 cents, sometimes two, two dollars. This is in the 70s. Two dollars, a whole lot of money. Two pieces of candy for, 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 for a penny. I mean, uh, and I noticed that she would hold me longer, and her kisses got closer to my lips. At 12 years old, on the hottest summer, I remember sitting outside in the courtyard, we used to play this game called Skelzies, where you take bottle tops and put tar on the inside of it and knock other people's uh, uh, caps out of, the, out of the box. She called me up to go to the store for her, and that day, she introduced me to the adult world of sexuality. I remember telling the school teacher, Mr. Rosenberg, that, you know, I, uh, this happened to me. And he was a social worker. And he says, I oh, don't worry about it. You, 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 at least you wasn't molested by a man. And, and you're a man now. But what he didn't realize that something happened to me. Number 12. I got locked into 12. 12. And so now, when I would hear people uh, sing the song, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, George Gary, happy birthday to you, it would always disturb me. In fact, I hate birthdays. I hate it. I hate my birthday, and I hate your birthday. I don't want you to invite me to your birthday party. I don't want to be a part of anything that has anything to do with birth. In fact, if you give me a birthday card, I don't even read the card. I just open it up and shake it. And if nothing falls, I really know how you feel about me. This thing bothered me all the way up till, all the way up to January the 23rd, 2015. I just got delivered from it of my young days to my old days, I'm having issues because of something that happened when I'm eight years old. And the question is, how old are you now? So I asked myself this question when the song was being sung. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, George Gary. Happy birthday to you. I was watching Dr. Phil, and Dr. Phil says, it normally takes a person three or four times to ask them the same question before you get the truth. So at the end of the song, it says, how old are you now? 52. How old are you now? 47. How old are you now? 12. How old are you now? Eight. It will blow your mind to find out how many people are still eight at 50. Eight at 50. You think you married a man and you married a boy. Boy. <laughs> You'll catch that on the way going home. When a person asks me, how old are you? I, I, got to, I got to go through the several me's that I am. Because sometimes you're talking to my eight years. Sometimes you're talking to my 12. Sometimes you're talking to my 32. Sometimes you're talking to my 47. How old are you now? I believe that crack that I was smoking and that heroin that I was shooting up in my toe for five years while preaching the gospel, sitting in the back rooms of churches, waiting for them to call me, zippering open my Bible bag and shooting up in my toe. While folks walk around pretending that they have a prophetic eye and can't see that this is not the anointing, this is Heron withdrawal. Y'all don't want no church tonight. <laughs> 32 years old, my mother called me and, I, and she says, I hear that you're going to Red Oak Projects. They had invited me at Red Oak Projects to go back to Red Oak Projects to preach at uh, Public School 27, where I grew up at and terrorized the whole school. And, and now I'm going there to, to, to preach. Can any good thing come out of the project? And, and I go there and I preach. 
and I do wonderful, and they invite me back the next year. One solid year later, between that time, the woman who had molested me died. I got a call from my mother, Hez, and she said, you know, such and such, I don't want to mention her name, such and such person passed away. And I said, wow. And I said, well, I'm going to be in New York. I'm doing a meeting. She says, well, you want to go to the funeral? I said, yes. So I go with my mother to this funeral, and in her older years, she had lost her vision and had to wipe bifocals. And they had her laying in the coffin, laying in the casket with the bifocals in her hand. And the undertaker came and says, well, the services, the wake is over for tonight. The, we're going to have the burial services tomorrow. And, uh, and, and you prepare yourself thus wise. And I said, Ma, can I have a few moments? My mother knew that I knew this woman and I worked along with this woman. So she figured I just want to pay my respects. The craziest thing happened to me. Everybody left the room and I'm standing there and this coffin is laid out and her bifocals is in there. And I just reach down in the coffin, pull her bifocals out of her hand, break them in half and throw them back in the coffin and walk out of the funeral home. While I'm walking out of the funeral home, I can feel a manifestation. I think that that 12 year old got left in the room. I think the dead was about to bury the dead that particular night. And I walked off. Three months later, I was back in Red Hook Projects to preach at Public School 27s. The place was jammed. And the driver that was driving me, I said, what I want you to do is I want you to drive me by where I used to live at because I want to show you where I lived at. Drive me over Columbia Street. So he drove me by Columbia Street. We pulled up and I looked towards the building. And we just sat there and I said, this is where I looked look, when I was a little kid and I was running streets and all, that, all this happening. And I said, good. And then a silent thing fell over me. And I told the driver, I said, drive off. The next night I preached and when I got finished preaching, I went to him, I said, I want you to take me back to where, and so he drove me back. And you know, sometimes our drivers want to minister to us. And so we pulled up to the building and I'm looking out the window and he turned around to me, he says, uh, 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 um, you, 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 you need to go in there? And I said, do you need to shut up? Nobody asks you to have no prophetic anointing right now. Just enjoy the view. And I looked there and I said to him, drive off, and he drove off. The last night of the meeting, true story, last night of the meeting I said, there was walking to him, I said, listen, before we go home, he said, yeah, I know, I know. You want me to take you back by the place? I said, okay, you want to be smart and stuff like that. You know, don't get too familiar with me. Now just take me back where I said to take me. And we went back and we parked in front of the building and I looked out of that window at that building, 453 Columbia Street, and my driver got ugly again and said to me, whatever is in that building bothering you, tonight's your last night to deal with it. I'll go with you with my, say, ain't nobody asked you to go nowhere with me. I don't even want you driving the car. The only reason why you're driving because I ain't got no license. I got out of the car and I walked into the building. And as I went into the building, immediately I went back to being 12 years old. The urination and defecation, the smell of it, the stench was there. The elevator was broken down. There was lights flickering. There was graffiti on the wall. It was as if I stepped right back into my old past. And I pushed for the elevator. The elevator came down, the door opened up, and the elevator broke down. And so I turned around to walk out of the building, and the Holy Spirit said to me, there's steps. So I turned around, and I started going up the steps. I now know the Holy Spirit was saying, there's steps to your deliverance. But you ain't going to ride this one up to the top. You're going to have to deal with this situation. And so I went and I knocked on the door, uh, apartment 3D, and a lady came to the door, and I said, I'm looking for such and such a person. She says, um, she doesn't live here anymore. She died. Well, of course I know she died. You know, I broke her glasses and threw them inside the, you know, I know she was dead, but I, I don't know what it is. She looked, she said, it was that George Gary. I was coming to your meeting. I'm coming tomorrow night. I said, well, the meeting's over tonight. She said, well, she died. She doesn't live here anymore. She died and she lived in apartment 3D. She said, would you like to come in? And I went in and nothing in the apartment resembled what had happened. The Lord was letting me know that you're holding on to something in your spirit that no longer even exists. It doesn't exist. 
I came out of that, 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 that building and, and, and went, came out of the apartment and went over and forgot and pushed the button to the elevator and the elevator came up. So the Lord just locked it down long enough so that he can teach me the steps of my deliverance. And say to your neighbor, you're about to be delivered. That's 32. Now 47, it's not too far off ago. You see, because I was smoking that crack and shooting up that hair on. Uh, a lot of preachers don't want me to talk about this, but this is the truth. There's a culture in the Christian world right now where, where folks are getting high. Now, now here's, I mean, I'm, ta I'm, 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 I'm not talking about smoking a weed. I'm talking about shooting up hair on laced with uh, embalming fluid and rat poisoning. I'm, 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 I'm talking about uh, this, this is where it's at. And I had a situation where uh, I had fallen out with a preacher uh, at a conference a, a, a year or two or three years ago and uh, in the lobby and I had to be called on the carpet because I was sort of kind of messing things up because I saw him in the lobby with sunglasses on and he was going through his hair on itch. And since I knew him well, I said, Doc, whatever you're doing, we need to get freedom for you. And he told me, I get out of his face. And I said, no, I'm getting in your face. These are people. I said, I know what time it was but the other folks who was around him didn't know what the deal was because they thought it was the Holy Ghost I was I was watching him on TV and could tell on TV that wasn't the Holy Ghost y'all ain't hear what I'm saying some of y'all too deep you're too deep I believe the Lord had me to come in contact with that because I did not want to be one of those persons that my congregation is looking for on a Sunday morning and I don't show up because I'm lying in a hotel room someplace dead out of some drug cocktail. How the enemy wants to snatch your life from you. I know what I'm talking about. Pilgrim Baptist Cathedral, New York City, called there many years ago to preach their prayer conference, their holy day. They're knocking on the door for me to come out of the pastor's study. I can't come out of the pastor's study because I can't get my shoestring back into my shoe. Because in the study, I opened up my bag and I got high in the pastor's study. And the Holy Spirit sobered me up long enough to preach that message that day. 90 people gave their life to the Lord. And when I was coming out of the pulpit, that drug high came back on me and I heard in my own voice, the voice of God say, I'll use you like you are, but I will not receive you into my presence. It, it, it is so clear to me that we can preach this gospel and souls are saved and we be a castaway. And so when I got delivered in, uh, of, 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 of crack cocaine and heroin and, and, and got delivered of it, uh, my, my, my dirty little secret was this, is that the enemy started uh, battling with me in the spirit realm in my mind. And so now I would go to sleep and sometimes I would be asleep for, for, for eight hours and 12 hours. I mean sleep a whole Saturday through because while I was asleep, I was smoking crack. I was visiting crack houses in my dreams. This might be too much for y'all tonight. Yeah, I think so. Visiting crack houses inside my, 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 my dream. Uh, you know, the world keeps on hearing all this fluff about the gospel, but there are people that are out there that are hurting. Someone is watching right now with a syringe in their hand. Someone is watching right now who is messed up and need to turn the television on to hear a gospel that saves and transforms and delivers and sets free. And you need to hear tonight that even us as preachers are under the attack of the devil. But if you find a praise, God will deliver you from the clutches of the enemy. And I'm down there in the crack house in my dreams, and I would wake up high. So I liked sleeping because I wasn't actually doing it. It was just happening in my dream life. And I would meet people in my dreams. And I woke up and I started praying against this, Lord, you got to help me with this. This is my dirt little secret and, I, and I, need, I need deliverance and I, I need to be set free from this thing. And that thing plagued me and came after me. One afternoon I came out of my house, jumped into my car on a Tuesday night on my way to Bible study. When I'm driving to Bible study, everything is fine. I drive right past my church, turn the corner, go down Pettigrew Street, go over the railroad tracks into the red light district pull up on the side and roll the window of my tent Mercedes Benz down and says to the drug man, give me an eight ball. 
Because if you keep on thinking it, eventually it will come and snatch you. And I said to him, I said, give me, give me an eight ball. And I hit him up with a thousand dollars. And, and, and while he was taking it, he, he signaled to the hopper to go and get the drugs. And while the hopper was going to get the drugs, he leaned down in the car to say something to me. And he looked at me and he said, Bishop Bloomer? I said, no, I ain't no Bishop Bloomer. <laughs> Bishop Bloomer? He handed it like this and he signaled the hopper. That means stop. And he threw the money back inside the car. $100 bills on the floor and over by the side of the passenger side. He said, Bishop Bloomer, what you out here doing trying to cop some drugs from a drug dealer? He said, ain't this your Bible study night? The drug dealer knew where my Bible study was. Because when you drive around town, my pictures are up on billboards and on the sides of buses. He said, ain't this your Bible study night? Now I'm upset when he said, listen, let me share something with you. I ain't selling you no drugs. What you coming out here messing around with me? He said, you're going to mess around and make God take his hand off my business. The drug dealer thought that God was blessing him too. that had been attacking me in my sleep and attacking me in my dream life was now trying to manifest this thing. And so I went to church and I stood up on the altar and I pulled the pulpit back and I set a, 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 a stool up there and I shared that Tuesday night with the congregation what had happened to me immediately so they could pray for me. Four weeks later, we put up the gospel tent on, 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 on Holloway Street and while I'm preaching, the drug dealer comes in and gives his life to Jesus. But the dreams doesn't stop. The dreams keeps on going on. And in my dream, I meet up with this girl that I am smoking crack with in my dream. I tell you the truth. And I'm smoking crack with this girl and I'm smoking crack with her all of about maybe three months in my dream life. And she has her syringe and her drugs in a dirty Hello Kitty bag. And I'm talking to her. And when I wake up out of the dream, I'll forget it, and sometimes while I'm driving, it comes back to me. And, I, and, and when I go to sleep again, I meet her in different crack houses. I rode in, in cars and on, on the back of bicycles in my dream going to these places. And I said, Lord, I don't understand what is going on, but the girl's name was Sylvia. And that is the truth. And I was out in California preaching in a service, and while I'm preaching a message like this, I looked over on the side, and the same girl that I saw in my dreams was sitting in the sanctuary. Got it on video. Thank you, Jesus. And the Holy Ghost said, that's her. That's her. Of course, I knew it was her, but I had never met her in person. That's her. The Holy Ghost said, that's her. That's her. And so I tried to keep on preaching. The Holy Spirit said, call her name. I said, Sylvia. And she looked up. He said, challenge her on the bag. I said, bring to me the Hello Kitty bag. Then she went wild. She went crazy. She started going crazy. They had to restrain her. She starts screaming. She runs down to the altar with the Hello Kitty bag. I open it up and she throws crack, cocaine, heroin, and syringes on the altar. Every time you find yourself in a situation where you've been going through, you tend to believe that you're just going through for yourself. A testimony is not thanking the Lord for your life, health, and strength, food on the table, or clothes on your back. That's a speech in a storefront church. A testimony is an undeniable experience that you have with God in the past to sustain you for any present or futuristical difficulties. A testimony is data and proof that the God that brought you up before will turn around and do it again. Ah, and this is your hour to come out of what the enemy has put on you. Grab your neighbor by the hand and say, oh, neighbor. I want you to understand a few things tonight. I may have gone down, but I'm coming back again. Everything the devil tried to do to me, everything the devil tried to do to me was for my building, it was for my spiritual upbringing. Can I preach a little bit in here? Accusations and criticisms are the final stage before spiritual promotion. You can always tell how blessed you're going to be tomorrow by how much hell you're going through right now. If you're going through hell right now, it's because God's going to bring you out. I dare you to shake your neighbor by the hand and say, oh neighbor, 
I'm coming out of my situation. I'm coming out of my storm. Nobody gets married so that your marriage ends up in divorce. Nobody has children so that children are snatched from you and awarded to the state. Who buys a car so the repo man can come and pick it up? Nobody purchases a house so your house ends up in foreclosure. But every now and then those things happen. And when they happen, you serve a God who can turn those things around for you. So I'm talking to everybody that's watching out there in television land. I'm talking to the drug dealer. I'm talking to the preacher. I'm talking to the crack addict. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. I come to tell you that it's time for you to lift up your head and give God another chance because you got one more great comeback. And this is the hour. This is the season. 2015 is the year of supernatural compensation. Somebody shout out and say, I want it all back.